Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 5106 in the name of Mark Griffin on cost of living support. I invite members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons or place an R in the chat function now or as soon as possible. And I call on Mark Griffin to speak to and move the motion for up to six minutes. Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. On the day inflation has broken a 40-year record, we are using our debate time to call on the Scottish Government to unlock a further £10 million for local cost of living support for low-income families. And by clawing back additional payments of the £400 October energy bill discount from those with second homes, which the Scottish Government amendment appears to accept the principle of, would close a loophole which allows the, the, those best off to get a double or potentially treble payment from the cost of living measures announced by the UK Government. The cost of our homes, the cost of keeping them running, safe and warm, is at the heart of this crisis. It may well be summer, but there are already hundreds of thousands of families that are dreading winter, desperately wondering how they will survive. Mortgages up £90 a month. Rent increases, the ONS confirmed this morning, now surpass those in England and Wales. Water bills up 4.2 per cent. And as of Monday, the energy cap is estimated to go up by £1,000 in just 100 days. Now, we often talk about someone having to choose between heating and eating, but that is really a polite way of putting it. The reality is that thousands will choose between starving or freezing. People will die this winter. That is a crisis that will only get worse, so the government must respond with action. And the irony will not be lost on anyone then that those best off, those able to afford to run not one but two homes, are set to pocket a windfall of almost £10 million between them, simply because they have another home that is not their main residence. Homes are for living in, and a cost of living support package should be benefit those who need help most. That is what we have demanded agreement on today, and I believe that we have secured. Allowing a select few to pocket a £400 bung because they collectively own or rent 24,000 second homes, 1 per cent of all stock in this country, will not deliver the fairness we expect. We welcome the fact that Rishi Sunak and the SNP finally listened to Labour's calls for a windfall tax on oil and gas companies making bumper profits. I will. Uh, I, I thank the member for taking this intervention. Can I ask if Labour will also be supporting uh, my amendment for today, which would look towards putting in place an increase in the single discount for council tax from 25 to 35 per cent to help families now? Mark Griffin. No, we won't be supporting the Conservative amendment today because it deletes large swathes of what we are trying to do. We are trying to focus um, very acutely on the £10 million that is going to second home owners that we feel should not be receiving that. And like I say, we have um, welcomed the fact that the Chancellor has introduced this payment, but in taking so long to accept that it was necessary, his support package rewards those with second homes with their very own windfall, wasting £10 million of taxpayers' cash. That was Rishi Sunak's error, but the Scottish Government appears following Labour pressure willing to act. And local authorities required to be consulted under the amended 2003 Local Government Act will be absolutely desperate for the powers to unlock a further £10 million to help the most vulnerable in their communities. I am delighted that the Government has chosen to change course on this, because just two weeks ago, the Rural Economy and Tourism Cabinet Secretary told me we would have to wait for the Rural and Islands Housing Plan, and like the Social Justice Secretary, the additional dwelling supplement was enough to tackle second homes. I, I will not at, at this moment. I have still got a lot of progress to make. Sorry, Mr Balfour. And, but, President Officer, I hope that when the Minister stands up, that we can get a cast iron assurance that the government will not hang about on this. These powers are already in play. Councils already remove discounts on second homes and charge a 100 per cent surcharge on homes left empty, raising £45 million a year for local house building each year. The work has to be done with the money uh, with, at councils by the autumn. We can't accept this being kicked into the long grass 
um, like the government has with other issues like the transient um, visitor levy, levy. Nor can we accept quibbling over issues around uh, potentially packed uh, council tax collection on empty homes. Um, we can't play politics with this. We need to recover these funds and get them to those who need them most. But uh, there is also a, a wider moral argument for taxing second homes more. Uh, until today, Scotland was the outlier across Great Britain, lacking plans for a surcharge on second homes. Even Michael Gove is introducing a surcharge on second homes, something that seems to have passed by the Conservative amendment today. But even before the pandemic, tens of thousands of Scots have been unable to find a place they can afford to call home, stuck on waiting lists, unable to get their foot on the property ladder, struggling to make um, ends meet to pay private rents. They do not have a warm, affordable and safe home. Second homes are those broadly left empty for much of the year, furnished a holiday home or crash pad for some. There are luxury communities crying out for families homes can't afford. With inflation now set to reach double figures by the end of this year and 100 days until the cap is increased, the government must use the summer to prove its willingness to act and remove the motion in my name. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Gibbon. Um, as I alerted the Chamber earlier, portfolio questions were really tight for time across the afternoon and with a later than usual decision time. I would appreciate if members could stick to the speaking allocations. There might be a little bit of time back for interventions, but really not an awful lot. I now call on the Minister, Tom Arthur, to speak to and move Amendment 5106.2 for up to five minutes. Mr Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And in moving this amendment, let me say that the Scottish Government welcomes this debate and the issue raised by the Labour Party is an important one. I will turn to the Government's response to the motion shortly and our wider response to the cost of living crisis. But before I do, let me first set out the Government's position on second homes. We recognise that good quality affordable housing is essential to support communities to prosper across Scotland. While second homes bring benefits to those who own them and the tourism businesses they support, we know that in some communities second homes can impact on the availability of property to meet local needs. It can also just as importantly impact on a community's sustainability. That is why we have already taken action on second homes. Since 2013, councils have been able to vary the discount against council tax for second homes, and since 2017 they have had the power to remove the discount in all or part of their council area. In January 2019, we increased land and buildings transaction tax additional dwelling supplement from 3% to 4% of the total purchase price for any additional home of £40,000 or more. This is intended to protect opportunities for first-time buyers in Scotland, but can act as a disincentive to second home purchases. We will consider all options as we take forward our commitment to introduce powers for local authorities to manage the number of second homes in their areas. This will recognise there are different challenges faced by urban and rural areas and will explore fiscal and non-fiscal options that will support the housing needs of different communities across Scotland. Turning to the issue raised by the motion today, we agree that it is clearly wrong that second homeowners benefit from the £400 energy rebate, rebate from the UK government that the UK government is making available. Using the council tax system to recover this £400 has merit, but is not straightforward. So, we will work with COSLA and local government to examine all options to recover this money, including through a council tax levied on second homes. In fact, we will explore going beyond just second homes and also consider applying a similar measure to long-term empty homes as well. We will explore using the funds raised to support local cost of living responses on a fair and equitable basis across councils, and I can confirm that I will be writing to COSLA this afternoon, certainly. Neil Bibby. I thank the Minister for taking that uh, intervention, and I welcome that he is going to explore this with, with COSLA. Obviously, we are living in a cost of living crisis at the moment. There is an emergency. We need to ensure su additional support is going to those who most need it. So, can I ask him about the timescales of that engagement? Because I do not think we have got time to waste in terms of recovering this money. Can I ask him what timescales he is going to be, be, be holding Minister. in this case? 
the member who may have I am writing to Coslow this afternoon on this matter, and I want these discussions to begin in earnest, because I do recognise the issues that the member raises. Now, turning to presiding officer, because I am conscious of time, to cost of living support, this government has shown that we respond quickly and effectively to economic crises, ensuring that appropriate support is in place for those on low incomes. At the height of the pandemic, we moved at pace to introduce our £100 COVID winter hardship payments for families, becoming the first administration in the UK to introduce such vital support. Through this measure, we put over £14 million in the pockets of low-income families in December 2020. We followed up with our £6 to £9 million investment in the £130 low-income pandemic payment to support over 530,000 low-income households in receipt of council tax reduction or who were exempt or not liable for council tax by the end of November 2021. Presiding officer, through the budget for 2022-23, the Scottish Government has allocated almost £3 billion to a range of supports that will contribute to mitigating the impact of the increased cost of living on households. This includes work to tackle child poverty, reduce inequalities and support financial wellbeing, alongside social security payments not available anywhere else in the UK. And our resource spending review prioritises £22.9 billion for social security assistance. Responding to the crisis, we also took the decision to uprate eight Scottish benefits by 6 per cent and to invest a further £10 million in our fuel insecurity fund to support households at risk of severely rationing their energy use or self-disconnecting. This is significant financial support for those living in Scotland, which will, prov which will provide protection for those on the lowest incomes that the rest of the UK do not have. While we do all that we can, we must not forget that it is Westminster that holds most of the powers needed to tackle the cost of living crisis, both in the immediate and longer term, including over energy, the minimum wage, national insurance and 85 per cent of social security spending. The Scottish Government has continually urged the UK Government to use all the powers and fiscal headroom at their disposal to address the cost of living crisis. As part of that, on the 25th May, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance wrote to the Chancellor setting out policies that would offer a long-term solution to the cost of living crisis. By ignoring our call for a comprehensive funding package to fully address the unprecedented cost of living crisis, the Chancellor's piecemeal approach makes it highly likely that more support will be needed when energy bills again rise significantly in the autumn. In concluding, Presiding Officer, I would say again that the Government welcomes this issue being raised by the motion. We will constructively examine all options to recover this money through a council tax levied on second homes and long-term empty properties in order to support local cost of living responses on a fair and equitable basis. We will engage with COSLA and local government on the most effective ways to do that. Taking that approach, presiding officer, fits with this government's commitment to tackling the cost of living crisis with all the tools that we currently have at our disposal. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Miles Briggs uh, for, to speak to and move Amendment 5106.1 for up to five minutes. Thank, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also start by thanking uh, the Labour Party for bringing forward today's debate? Uh, because every MSP will be acutely aware of the cost of living pressures facing people across the country at the moment and the need for every level of government to be working to help support individuals and families during this difficult time. The economic pressures we are facing are considerable. Pressures created by global events, including rises in fuel prices, Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, and the country recovering from COVID-19 pandemic are causing a strain on all cost of living. Uh, for families and businesses, they are being negatively impacted due to inflation and the rises in everyday prices. That's why it is welcome and why I brought forward my amendment um, that the UK government has taken a number of key actions that will support the most vulnerable households in our country with £1,200 of support payments. The new measures being brought forward by UK ministers to help address the cost of living crisis are welcome and the start of what must be a concerted effort to drive down cost of living pressures. The energy bill support scheme will see every household receive £400 off their energy bills, with additional funding being provided to those on benefits, people with disabilities and pensioners. It's also important to note that raising the national insurance threshold and cutting universal credit taper rate will allow people to keep more of the money they earn, as well as actions to cut fuel duty and lower uh, fuel costs as well. Taken together as a package, that is £37 billion of focused spending on the most vulnerable families in Scotland and across the UK. Deputy Presiding Officer, from next month, around 8 million people 
on the lowest incomes in the country will also receive a cost of living payment of £650, support worth well over £5 billion to give people the support they need during these challenging times. And the Department for Work and Pensions will make these payments in two lump sums, the first being in July and the second in autumn, with payments from HMRC to those on tax credits following shortly after. It is welcome and also worth reflecting that the Social Security Additional Payments Bill um, has been tabled today at Westminster and is progressing through Parliament there. Uh, Deputy President Officer, we know that pensioners and disabled people are disproportionately impacted by higher energy costs. And that's why from this autumn, the UK Government will deliver additional support to over 8 million pensioner households who receive the winter fuel payment, an extra one-off pensioner cost of living payment of £300. Direct help is being provided to people, and we need to make sure that every level of government is doing just that. Uh, many disabled people, for example, will also receive a payment of £650, taking the total uh, cost of living payment to over £800. That is real action from the UK government. But we on these benches want to see more. Um, if I can get the time back. Um, Only some of it, I suspect. It's very, very short. Uh, in addition to things that he's mentioned, is there anything happening at the UK government level that's going to uh, deal with the regulation of uh, fuel costs? Miles, um, well, these discussions are taking place as we speak, and I think it's important uh, that they're being developed. But we've seen action already with that 5% cut, and I think the, we all want to see more action, and that's something which I'm pleased the Chancellor has been leading on. Um, but we on these benches also want to see more action from the Scottish Government, which we're here to debate today. That's why I have raised the need, and we stood on a manifesto at the Council elections, to look towards how we can increase the single person discount uh, for council tax from 25 per cent to 35 per cent. This is a measure which could directly uh, be used by SNP ministers now to help every single person in Scotland uh, save an average of £134 a year in an average band D property. Um, that is not a bureaucratic uh, process. That is something this parliament could pass and could deliver the support which is needed. So I'm disappointed that the Labour Party and I take it uh, SNP ministers will be also not supporting that support which we brought you're not going to get any oh, right. time no, back. I, I can't in that case. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Conservatives uh, want to see and do support uh, the measures which have been brought forward by Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, in the spring statement and for this cost of living statement as well uh, to deliver the support which all of our constituents are looking for. To conclude, supporting people across Scotland and the UK with the cost of living crisis is critical, but we also need to focus on building a stronger economy. Uh, that's why we must see a relentless focus from both of Scotland's governments on creating more well-paid jobs, cutting taxes for working people, driving business investment and innovation, unleashing the new skills revolution and levelling up growth across all parts of Scotland and the United Kingdom. And I move the amendment in my name. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Briggs. And I call on Willie Rennie for up to four minutes, Mr Rennie. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt that Miles Briggs presents a very reasonable case um, but the truth is that his amendment today deletes the central purpose yeah. of Labour's motion, which is to actually pull back or from 25,000 properties, the owners of 25,000 properties, around about £400 each. Now, he never explained why he, he never defended his position today. Um, and I think he also didn't defend... I think some of the reprehensible behaviour of some of his colleagues, um, particularly at Westminster, who seek to blame the poor for their budgetary difficulties at times, including they should cook better and they should budget better. And I think it would be better. I'll take an intervention from Miles Briggs if he's going to explain Miles that. Briggs. Uh, I, I think in terms of where the Labour Party and the government are, um, we don't have this mechanism, so it's quite clear that this can't happen now. My amendment brings forward something which can, and a £134 discount could be delivered. So the fact that the government have moved uh, to go and ask COSLA to look at this is one thing, but it's not delivering help here and now. Willie Rennie. Um, the motion today and the fact that the government is accepting the principle of this does indicate that it is possible to do this. And I'm disappointed that Miles Briggs wasn't even prepared to explore that proposition um, in, his, uh, in his speech. Um, the scale of the, the problem is significant. The ONS data today is really quite stark. The, the food, drink and clothes costs for an average, a typical family is now at £5,780 per year, up £425 in one year. 
the fuel costs for a typical family up 310. In addition to the Conservatives' tax hikes, which is around about 640, this is a £1,300 hit before you even get to the energy costs. This is an enormous cost. And then when you look at the fact that the, the increase in VAT tax take now means an extra £8.6 billion pounds over the next year into the government's coffers, means I think the government can go much further than it's currently gone just now. And I would have liked to have heard Miles Briggs perhaps putting pressure on the UK government to do something along those lines, because that would mean another £430 per family. Now, I think we should take some immediate action to cut VAT from 20 to 17.5 per cent, because that would take some immediate help to families, and I think that's what we should be supporting. Now, we will support uh, Labour's motion today. We I'm actually really short of time. I would like to, but I'm really short uh, of time. But the fact that to today's debate is happening, it probably signifies a wider problem that we've got in society. The fact that 25,000 properties are now classed as second homes, I think indicates we need to take wider and firmer action on the increasing numbers of homes that are taken out of circulation for working families in places like mine in North East Fife, particularly the East Nuke of Fife, where people can't afford to live in the communities that they're working. The prices of properties are sky high, and they're of, often occupied by second homeowners who only live in the, in the properties very periodically. So I think this speaks to a wider problem, which is why I've been pressing the government for a clearer indication about where they're going to go on tackling the number of second homes. We did take some steps on the short-term lets, but the other half of the equation is we need to take steps on second homes as well. So we will support um, Labour's motion today. Um, it will introduce another £10 million uh, to the Scottish Government finances, which we can use to target to those who are most in need. So that's why we support it today. And I'll conclude on that point, Deputy President Officer. Very wise, Mr Rennie. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to the open debate, uh, and I call Alec Rowley to be call followed by Christine Graham for up to four minutes, Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. And I certainly support the, the motion that's brought forward today, and I'm pleased to support the, the amendment. We need to look at how we can support people and support those that are in the greatest need. So it is, as Willie Rennie talked about, targeted support and how do we deliver on targeted support. The Tories, they plan to relax controls on city bosses' pay, so we can see who they want to target, and it is more to the rat while the poor suffer, and that cannot be acceptable. We need to recognise that for older people, people with disabilities, they will use a lot more energy. So you can imagine the difficulties that, that they're facing right now, and that's one group of people but the fact is that wages have stagnated over a number of years. The Tories try and say that we need to hold wages down because of inflation, but we know that it is energy costs that are spiralling out of control that is leading to the high inflation we have. And I fear greater inflation uh, going forward, so the pressures will be even greater. Now, there are things that the Scottish Government can do. If you look at, for example, the public sector workers and the wage claims that are coming forward at the present time. So the government have offered 5 per cent to NHS workers, but for some NHS workers on the lowest pay, that will be perhaps £1,000 a year. For NHS workers on much higher pay, that is £5,000 a year. So the unions are rightly saying that is not fair. In terms of local government, the offer on the table now seems to be 2 per cent. So for the chief executive of Fife Council earning 200 and odd thousand pounds a year, 2 per cent is quite, a, quite an offer. But it's not the same for low paid workers on 15, 20 thousand pounds a year. So the Scottish Government, I think, will have to look again in terms of wages and ensuring that local authorities have the funding to be able to pay the lowest paid workers so that they can actually tackle this, the, this, this problem. Um, as I say, the Tories are quite happy to, to try and help the rich but not help the poor. But it's also time for all people 
in this country. Gordon Brown spoke at the weekend and said all people of conscience and goodwill, faith groups, charities, foundations, local councillors, mayors and concerned business, business leaders, all in the country's nation and regions, nations and regions, to call on the Chancellor for a fourth budget to prevent what is likely to be the biggest rise in family poverty that we have seen in our lifetime. So I would hope that this, this Parliament could unite behind such a call, because yes, there's more the Scottish Government can do, yes, there's things that we all need to do to try and help, but the reality is that the Chancellor needs to bring forward a budget that will actually tackle these problems and tackle them head on. This Parliament could begin by uniting in a call on the Government to restore the £20 universal credit uplift and take steps to help those families right now. As we came towards this crisis, the Tories actually cut money from some of the poorest people in the country and people that were in work. Remember, tax credits were there to help people who were low paid, so we can unite in this Parliament and ask them to restore that. By next winter, it is likely that over five million children across the UK will be living in poverty in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, because we have a government that is refusing to act. No, the member has up. just concluded. So, so I would appeal, let's join together, let's work together. The amendment shows that the government is willing to do that. Let's work together and call on the UK government to take the steps that it needs to take to address this crisis now. Thank you, Mr. Rennick. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Paul Sweeney. I will be enforcing the four-minute um, deadlines from now on. Ms. Graham. Crumbs, I'm frightened now. Uh, can, <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, can I thank the Labour Party for bringing this motion? And I absolutely support the clawing back of the £400 payment being credited to people with second homes, indeed third and fourth homes, and until longer-term uh, unoccupied homes. Incidentally, I think Rishi Sunak has at least four homes. I'm not sure if number 11 Downing Street is one and maybe his party neighbour next door. They're not. They're not getting it. You seem to know more than me. It is obvious that this was rushed, though, so the Conservatives could be seen to be doing something. So, as you can understand, I support your motion, and I'm glad you also support the SNP amendment, which I think adds value and detail to the substantive motion. But I say to people that even if you only receive that £400 credit once, let alone multiple times, and frankly, you can manage without then you can always donate a like sum to a food bank, because you can't get round it any other way. That said, this is a sticking plaster, and it is in all inflationary circumstances, the economically vulnerable, the single parents, the low people on low incomes, pensioners and the disabled always suffer. The worst is to come. The days are mild, heating is off or on low, though some housebound will have to have the heating on, whatever it's like outside. Domestic energy costs are set to rise, around £3,000 a year, and food inflation has not yet peaked. There is, of course, no cap on home heating oil, much used in areas such as Midlothian, South Tweedale and Lauderdale, because it's unregulated. Of course, the war in Ukraine is having an impact on the UK economy, but why is it that we have one of the highest inflation rates in the G7, with the exception of Russia? And that's because the destructive impact of Brexit can no longer be camouflaged by COVID. These are not my words. The Centre for European Reform Analysis shows that Brexit has cost the UK billions of pounds in lost trade, lost investment, lost taxes, money this country could really do with at a time of rising debt and falling living standards. This is all relevant to the crisis that people find themselves in. According to London School of Economics, Brexit alone has caused a 6% spike in UK food prices. And these are independent sources. As for COVID, the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, the oldest non-partisan economic research institute in the UK, has criticised Rishi Sunak after he failed to take out insurance against rate rises in quantitative easing reserves. That cost 900 billion. That's 900,000 million or 2,000 pounds per person. This is economic chaos and mismanagement. Add to that at least £11 billion wasted in useless PPE, which requires to be incinerated, 
and the profligacy and incompetence of the UK government running the economy is there for all of us to see. But the people who suffer are not the bankers. They're not the people who've made a lot of money and will continue to take money during inflation. It's the people who are vulnerable. So I call on the Chancellor to slash the 20% VAT on fuel, which already has duty levied on it, so you've got a tax and a tax. That would reduce transport costs for commercial, for the public sector and for essential personal travel to reinstate the uplift on universal credit of £20 per week. I call on the UK Government to proactively pursue the uptake of benefits. For example, 40% of those entitled to pension credit do not claim. They should be pushing that those people claim it. Perhaps the Treasury just wants to keep that money. But I know that's not enough. Here we have stretched mitigation to its limits. We must detach ourselves from this failing UK government and with independence set our course for a just society. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Graham. I now call on Paul Sweeney to be followed by Alexander Stewart again for up to four minutes, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted to be able to contribute to this debate today and to support the motion in the name of my friend Mark Griffin. The cost of living crisis is the biggest challenge facing families across Scotland and the wider United Kingdom. Inflationary pressures, stagnating wages and geopolitical upheaval have resulted in a perfect storm. Food prices are up, energy prices are up and fuel prices are up. And in the past year, the cost of an average family's food shopping has increased by almost £400. Energy prices per household have jumped by over £700 and look set to increase by the same again in October. And fuel prices have increased by almost £1 a litre meaning that the average family car now costs £100 to fill up. And of course, our housing costs are amongst the highest in Europe, with that rent-seeking behaviour sapping our real productive potential across the economy. And whilst this is all happening, wages have stagnated for over a decade. Even those offered wage rises this year are not likely to be offered a raise high enough to keep up with rising inflation. We should be in no doubt that this combination of price increases and compressed wages are really biting hard. Citizens Advice Scotland estimate that one in every five people in Scotland now run out of money before payday. The stress and fear that causes every month to families is frightening. The Poverty and Inequality Commission estimate that one in four children live in poverty in Scotland, one in five working age people in Scotland live in poverty, and 61% of working age adults living in poverty are living in a household where someone is in employment? Are we really going to just accept that this is the norm? Or are we going to pretend that this isn't going to get significantly worse by the end of the year? Deputy Presiding Officer, it is essential that we understand the underlying factors driving this inflation. Brexit, labour market shortages and the post-pandemic clamour are undoubtedly playing their part. But there is also an egregious economic power grab at play here too. IPPR Scotland and Commonwealth published research this week highlighting that net profits for companies are up by a staggering 33% compared with before the pandemic. And 90% of that are profits made by just 25 companies. At a time where workers have been told by the Tories and some in the SNP that their demands for better wages are increasing and exacerbating inflationary pressures, we should instead understand that excess profits are a much greater driver and we should be considering measures to ensure that profit restraint and its redistribution to ensure greater income equality through taxing investments at the same rates we do income is an un underutilised and underappreciated tool at our disposal. The demands for pay restraint come at a time when railway workers are taking strike action for better pay terms and conditions. And I want to put on record my solidarity unequivocally and completely, because workers have been ripped off for too long. Blamed for the failings of success of governments to address the structural fragilities at the heart of our economy, they have decided to stand up and be counted by using their power to collectively bargain. So I pay tribute to the RMT for their work and rather than criticising unions for democratically representing the views and wishes of their members, we should be encouraging other sectors to unionise and collectively bargain for better working conditions. 
Because if workers aren't able to use their collective power to bargain, they are left begging the owners of capital. We need to tackle this crisis with a clear understanding of the underlying structural problem, and frankly, neither government is doing much in that regard. Contrary to what the Bank of England's governor tells us, you need the, to way, conclude, Mr. Sweeney. the way we need to get out of this mess is to put more money into people's pockets and to see more profit restraint from businesses, not the other way around. Thank you. I now call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to four minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be speaking in favour of the amendment today and the motion in the name of Miles Briggs. Over the last two years, the pandemic required financial interventions that were previously unheard of. Unprecedented times required and resulted in unprecedented measures. In total, the UK Government spent £410 billion to mitigate the efforts uh, and effects of the pandemic, and Scotland's Government received an extra £14.7 billion in consequentials. While Scotland is finally on, on road to recovery from the pandemic itself, we are still facing difficult and uncertain times, Deputy Presiding Officer. As such, I welcome the package of measures that have been put in place to tackle the cost of living crisis. Following two years of COVID spending, it can be hard to put into context just how extensive these measures have now become. However, a package to support totalling over £37 billion is significant by any measure, Deputy Presiding Officer. Whilst in the motion today, Labour have chosen to focus on a specific aspect of the financial support that the truth is that the package to support one comes at, from all directions. The cost of living payments to increase the minimum wage, the fuel duty cuts and, of course, the energy bill support scheme. Whilst the scheme will deliver financial support to every household in Great Britain, the fact is, Deputy Presiding Officer, that three quarters of the total financial support will go to the most vulnerable in our communities, and that is to be welcomed. As my party's shadow for older people, I welcome the fact that pensioners in receipt of pension credits will be over £1,600 better off as a result of some of this support. While this support is welcome, the onus lies now with the Scottish Government to do more in this area. These include arranging and, re and ensuring that the burden of tax uh, is matching that uh, within the UK, and that when it comes to income tax cuts. Increasing the single person tax cut discount to 35 per cent is something we have called for and continue to do so. I am afraid my time is limited. It also includes helping local authorities to be flexible to respond to the needs of individual households in each area of the country. While councils are best placed to respond to the local needs in this way, their job has been made significantly harder Deputy Presiding Office, by the legacy of cuts that they have faced over the last decade. Though it is not to suggest that this government should look towards Labour's solutions, presiding officer, to support the Scottish public through the crisis given, but the tax support that Labour is, is, is looking at, the support that Labour and the SNP would raise from this, is half the energy profit levy that is expected to deliver. Presiding over, over the last two years, we have seen unprecedented package of financial support delivered by governments the worldwide and the world over, and a huge amount of funding has been affected. We saw with the initiatives of the furlough scheme that protected over one million Scots jobs during the pandemic. We are seeing it again with the energy bill support scheme. I have spoken before in this chamber about the broad financial shoulders of the United Kingdom, and this is a, an opportunity to once again ensure that that is the case. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, only by working together with the UK Government and delivering on the potential that the broad shoulders provide, can the Scottish Government deliver and, and recover from COVID that the public and the Scottish public expect? I support the amendment in the name of Miles Briggs, because that today shows the amount of time, the amount of effort and the amount of resource that has been putting in to try and tackle this issue, which will continue to be a, an issue for us going forward. But we are moving forward and we are tackling in the best way we can. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. Um, the next three speakers will join us uh, online, starting with uh, Paul McLennan, to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Up to four minutes, and I will hold you to that in the same way as I am holding members in the chamber, Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Labour Party for bringing forward the debate that this afternoon? Uh, the cost of living crisis is impacting on all of our constituencies in all parts of Scotland. Can I support the amendment that the Scottish Government has proposed 
to afternoon and hope that the Labour Party can support this. I would agree that the UK government's £400 energy rebate has not been thought through and will apply to second homes. The motion from the Labour Party has merit. The Scottish Government, as has been indicated by the Minister, has already been working on the issue of second homes and have already changed legislation to ensure that council tax discounts are in the hands of local authorities. The Scottish Government will be working with newly formed causal leadership to examine all options to recover this money through a council tax levied on second homes. And are considering, as the Minister said, expanding the measure to long term empty homes. I am glad that the Minister has written to COSLA today, and I am sure COSLA will come back very quickly. I think COSLA will welcome this consensus approach and to ensure that it is sustainable and, and fair. In this short speech, I want to look at the current situation and what we need to do to support the most vulnerable in society. This morning, East Lothian Food Bank reported a year on year increase of 86 per cent on food bank usage and reported its busiest ever month. The cost of living uh, is increasing all over the world due to inflationary pressures, fuel costs, food costs and, of course, the war in Ukraine. However, make no mistake, this has been exacerbated by the symbolic management of the economy by the UK Tory party. Inflation this morning reached a 40-year high at 9.7. And remember, growth rate is projected to be the lowest in the G20 apart from Russia. The Institute for Fiscal Studies estimates that inflation is hitting the poorest households harder as they spend more of their money on gas and electricity. And I would echo what other speakers are saying the UK government needs to do more on costs of energy. And on Brexit, the Resolution Foundation in a report last week said leaving the UK has reduced how competitive Britain's economy is, and which in turn is reducing productivity and workers' real wages. The report, which was in collaboration with the London School of Economics, said that the impact of Brexit has been clear, with a depreciation-driven inflation spike, increasing the cost of living for households, and seeing in business and investment falling. Brexit is a word that you'll never hear from the Tory benches. We've heard nothing about it this afternoon. No acknowledgement at all of its impact on Scotland and the poorest in society. The research estimated that labour productivity is being reduced by 1.3%. Which is contributing to weaker wage growth, which real pay is set to fall about £500 per worker each year on average than it would have been otherwise. Citizens Advice Scotland found that one in three Scots find energy bills unaffordable, and shamefully, almost half a million people in Scotland have had to choose between heating and eating. President Officer, in conclusion, the UK Government must go further in providing targeted direct support for those most in need. Of course, doubling the discount household energy bills. To four hundred pounds is welcome, but it still doesn't do enough to mitigate the impacts of price increases for those least able to pay. The Scottish Government is investing almost seven hundred and seventy million pounds this year in cost of living support, including a range of family benefits not available to anywhere else in the UK, mitigating the bedroom tax and benefit cap and increasing Scottish benefits by six per cent. One point eight billion pounds has been committed to the Scottish child payment over the next years next four years, combined with the three best start grants and best start foods. Finally, it is the Westminster that holds most of the powers needed to tackle the cost of living crisis, both in the immediate and the longer term. Leavers over energy, the minimum wage, national insurance, and 85 per cent of social security powers. The Scottish Government is supporting the most vulnerable in the society in many ways. With the powers of independence, we could do much more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McLennan. I now call on Ariane Burgess to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Again, up to four minutes, Ms Burgess. Good evening, officer. And I, too, would like to thank Mark Griffin for bringing this important issue to the foreground. It is incumbent on the Scottish Government to do everything it can to mitigate the harsh impacts of the cost of living crisis. This is undeniable, and I doubt, as we have heard today, that anyone will disagree. The cost of living crisis is plunging countless households into fuel and food poverty, and is making the comings and goings of everyday life extremely challenging for people across Scotland. Projections emanating from the Bank of England do not offer reassurance. On the contrary, its government, governor now expects an astounding peak in the rate of inflation at 11 per cent, which is a worrying figure, to put it mildly. Scrutiny of energy and finance policy is essential now, but such scrutiny must be focused on where decisions are made on energy and finance policy. It is surprising that the measures taken by a Tory government led by ultra-wealthy and law-breaking individuals is disproportionately benefiting the rich in times of crisis. But let us contrast UK government actions with our own government's actions, because this government is not exempt from scrutiny and should not shy away from sound proposals for improvement. 
the Scottish Government is rightly extending itself to support individuals and families in this unprecedented challenging time. Under the defective devolution settlement, this must be done within the bounds of severe resource constraints. But this is necessary to limit the damage inflicted by the UK Government's inaction and ineptitude. For example, as the Minister stated earlier, the Scottish Government is investing £770 million in cost of living measures, including uprating eight Scottish social security payments by 6% to support people facing rising costs. Thanks to the progressive alliance between the Greens and SNP in government, almost £1.8 billion is being committed to the Scottish child payment over the next four years. The £20 per child per week doubled in April, and this will increase further by £20, £25 by the end of the year, when it will also be extended to under 16s. On the other hand, the UK government is providing a grand package of £37 billion, including the Energy Bills Support Scheme. But the devil's in the detail. All households will receive this £400, including second homes and households on high and super high incomes. The Tory government have made the completely inadequate suggestion that those who don't need the 400 simply donate it to a charity of their choice. This is not good enough. The wealthy and ultra-wealthy do not enjoy their status because of their voluntary care and generosity. So the Scottish Government must consider all of its options to mitigate the regressive impact of UK government policy. This is nothing new. In principle, the motion in question today is a welcome one. But we need to be careful when the opposition in this chamber demands a top-down intervention, effectively prescribing to local authorities how they should govern their finances. It's essential that any proposed measures directly affecting local government are designed in the first instance in consultation with COSLA and with other relevant stakeholders. I support in principle the empowerment of local authorities, enabling them to design and implement targeted fiscal policies, such as increased council tax aimed at second homes. But more generally, I want to use this opportunity to say that these reactive proposals from Labour do not solve the problem. Depending on the appetite for this by COSLA and among stakeholders, I agree that local authorities need to be empowered in this way indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burgess. Uh, and we now move to Ruth Maguire, the final speaker in the open debate, uh, for up to four minutes. Ms. Maguire. Thank you, Mr. And I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate. Um, I support the proposals set out by Labour as amended by the Scottish Government. I think that the addition of empty homes and the importance of equitable distribution um, adds value to their motion. Although the cost of living crisis brings bad news for almost everyone, it's those on low to middle incomes for who it potentially poses uh, an unmanageable challenge and it is predicted to get worse. Inflation is now at a 40-year high, with the Office for National Statistics blaming higher food prices, particularly for everyday staples such as bread, cereal and meat, for the increase. And while higher earners may be able to absorb this cost, years of austerity and low income growth under Tory governments left those on the lowest earnings with little to no room to manoeuvre. Resolution Foundation reported that for those with the lowest earnings, Disposable incomes increased by £3,456 between year 2000 and 2020, but for the richest, their income grew by £12,393. The supermarket ASD has commented today that some shoppers are setting £30, limit, 30 pound limits at checkouts and at petrol pumps, customers putting less in their baskets and switching to budget ranges. Presiding officer, while the doubling of the energy discount to £400 is not unwelcome, it falls short of mitigating price increases for those least able to afford their energy bills. And while second home will receive double payments, others are not eligible for any payments. I've been contacted by constituents who live on a park home estate, and due to having no direct utility account, they'll not receive any help with their energy bills. This is a concern which has not been addressed. And yet, the UK Chancellor has chosen to spend only half £30 billion that he has at his disposal. Over the last two years, the Scottish budget has fallen by 5.2%, with another 1% sustained until 2026. Despite this, the Scottish Government have made an investment of £770 million in cost of living support. 
We saw the Scottish Child Payment doubled in April, which will again rise by the end of the year. Together with the three Best Start grants and Best Start Food, will provide Scottish families with more than £10,000 by the time their first child turns six. <clears throat> Excuse me. Child Poverty Action Group has reported this combined value of Scottish government policies, along with lower childcare costs, reduces the net cost of bringing up a child by up to 31% for low-income families providing some much-needed relief. What's more, to help address the current cost of living pressures and to also recognise the needs of families pre-school age, SNP-run North Ayrshire Council have agreed to increase the scheduled summer child bridging payment of £130 to £230. This is an additional one-off payment of £100 for families within my constituency and throughout North Ayrshire who already receive low-income free school meals and the child bridging payment. Presiding officer, there's no respite from the relentless rise in prices, some facing the terrifying reality of not being able to afford the basics and increasing numbers facing stark choices. It is Westminster who hold the most powers needed to tackle the cost of living crisis. It's time they flexed their fiscal powers and realised lower income households do not have the flexibility available to them that higher income households use to manage price increases. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Maguire. We now move to the uh, closing speeches, and I call first Jeremy Balfour for up to five minutes, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. We are experiencing some of the most extraordinary global events in my lifetime. The war in Ukraine, broken supply chains and rising energy prices, all while the world is struggling to get off its knees post-pandemic. Across the world, people are looking at their bank balance worrying that it's worth less than it was the day before, and it's incumbent upon governments to support those who serve any means that is available to them. That includes both direct support to those who are in need, but most also to ensure that they get a handle on inflation so as to slow the depreciation of people's hard-earned savings. Deputy President of Scotland is fortunate to have a government in Westminster that is committed to providing this support. Throughout the pandemic, the UK Government provided an unprecedented level of support to the people of Scotland, spending over £400 billion in total. The furlough scheme, unwritten, uh, underwritten by the broad shoulders of the Exchequer, allowed millions of families to remain safe at home without having to worry about the risk of health for paycheck. The fast and efficient rollout of the United Vaccine Scheme allowed our economy to remain resilient. We managed to get shots and arms faster than any other European country, leading to our economy bouncing back to above pre-pandemic levels. Presiding officer, the UK government not only has a track record for backing up this commitment to supporting the people of Scotland, but as both my colleagues on this bench have pointed out, it continues to back up as providers aid to those who are in need in this difficult time. There are a number of measures that have been implemented at this time. The £400 energy grant promises to make a real difference to those who struggle with global rise in energy prices. The cut in fuel duty to, by five pence per litre lowers the proportion of commuter, uh, commuter's wage that have to be spent on travel, again putting money directly in the pockets of hard-working Scottish people. It represents an amazing £5 billion in savings for commuters. The universal credit taper has been adjusted to make sure that people who are receiving support can take, him, take home more of their hard-earned pay without the fear of losing their benefits. A £150 cost of living payment for disabled people will help to cover the extra costs that fall on those who are disabled, ensuring that some of the most vulnerable people in Scotland don't suffer excessively because of an accident of birth or later in life. Pensioners uh, who are in receipt of a winter fuel payment will receive an extra £300 to help with the cost of utilities. Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope that you can see a theme here. The UK Government has time after time is supporting the people of Scotland, especially those who are the most in need. And finally, Presiding Officer, on that theme, I want to put on record my full support for the amendment in the name of my colleague, Miles Briggs. I wonder whether, in summing up for the Labour Party, 
we can answer two questions that we haven't been able to uh, take in interventions. Firstly, how much will it cost to recoup the £10 million in administration costs? And secondly, how quickly and with what scheme will they do to be able to get that money back? We've heard from a minister that he's written to COSLA. I suspect the reason he's written to COSLA is that he knows it's not possible to get the money back. And if that's not the case, perhaps when they're summing up, they can clear that. I'm afraid my time is almost gone. We on these branches fundamentally believe that people know better what to do with their money than the government does. Raising the single person's discount on counter tax to 35% would provide a huge boost to those who live alone and again will keep hard earned wages in the pockets of these who need them. This is a measure that we in this parliament can and should implement now with the powers that we have and if we were serious, I'm sorry, my time's almost gone. And if we were serious, if SNP and Labour were serious in regard to a commitment, they would be supporting our amendment this evening and we would be doing something before the end of this parliament goes into recess. The UK government is taking this commitment seriously. Sadly, others aren't. And I hope that we do support the Conservative Amendment because it will do something practically that will actually affect people today rather than just giving words of warmth which will do nothing to help people's actual circumstances. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank Officer. you, Mr Balfour. I now call on the Minister, Ben McPherson, um, for up to four minutes. Uh, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And like many others, I really welcome this debate. And to be honest, uh, with uh, the exception of the last contribution, I think this afternoon has shown this Scottish Parliament at its best. MSPs working together to help those we serve as much as we can at a time of real need. And I particularly welcome that those of us on the left and in the centre of the political spectrum are constructively collaborating uh, to make a meaningful difference and to build a, a more just society. Uh, and this is something to be welcomed going forward as well. And that's why we also uh, welcome and support the proposal from Labour, uh, but will be uh, doing more by also considering how to effectively ensure that long-term empty homes, uh, which are a blight in many communities, also do not benefit from the £400 energy rebate. And we will also do so in conjunction with local authorities through COSLA. There will be a, a range of detailed considerations to work through, uh, and we want to do that in a constructive way with local government uh, to find the most effective method of ensuring that the £400 energy rebate for second homes and empty homes can be used to tackle the cost of living crisis in, in local communities. So we will work with um, COSA to examine all options to recover this money through a council tax levied on second uh, and empty homes. We will also work with them to ensure that this is done in a fair and equitable way and uh, considering the, the demographics uh, in, in Scotland and is it, it is possible uh, that any action to provide powers to councils to address this through council tax will require legislation. And again, uh, we look forward to working with the Labour Party and others uh, and having their full support for any necessary legislation required. In terms of um, second homes, we are aware of the impact uh, that these have and short-term lets have in many communities. Uh, and it is often raised an issue that comes up uh, to local residents finding homes uh, to live in, a point that Willie Rennie uh, made well. And that's why we took action on short-term lets, both in terms of planning uh, and in terms of creating the licensing scheme. Also, our long-term housing strategy, Housing to 2040, outlines our intention to give local authorities the power to manage the number of second homes, and uh, they will see this, uh, where they see this as a problem in their locality. Uh, and since 2013, councils have been able to vary the discount uh, against council tax for second homes. And in 2017, we changed legislation to ensure that council tax discounts for second homes are either no longer available uh, or in the hands of local authorities. And we are also um, taking actions through land and buildings transaction tax uh, through our additional dwelling supplement. And we will, of course, uh, be reviewing that as we uh, committed to in the budget. Members have, have rightly asked um, that the government must respond, and as the Scottish Government, we of course absolutely are. Uh, we have put in place a considerable package of support that uh, the Minister for Public Finance set out at the start of this debate, uh, with a, a package of almost £3 billion to a range of supports uh, that will contribute to mitigating the impact of the increased cost of living uh, on households. And of course, we will continue 
to look to do more uh, where we can with the, the limited powers that we have and the constrained budget that we have. In terms of uh, the suggestion put forward by the Conservative Party, I would uh, think it is important to, to state that uh, increasing uh, the single person discount to 35 per cent um, would need uh, to have a budgetary cut elsewhere uh, because it would cost more than £100 million and not be means tested. So, uh, as is too often the case, unfortunately, the Conservative Party have uh, brought an idea of spending more, but not considered where that resource would come from in other parts of the budget. So, you know, we need to see some more seriousness from the Conservative Party if they are interested in actually making a meaningful difference in debates like today, like the Labour Party have. Um, no, I certainly will not. Um, the but Minister is just uh, winding up. Because, as, as others have said, um, we, we really need to remember that the Westminster Government holds most of the powers needed to tackle the cost of living crisis. We have welcomed the uh, initiative that they have taken, but they still need to do more, both in the immediate and the longer term, using their fiscal headroom and their powers, uh, the, including ideas like from Alex Rowley around the £20 pounds universal credit uplift uh, and also action on investments like Paul Sweeney mentioned, which of course uh, are reserved. Do you need to conclude now, Minister? So, you have to, oh, five minutes. Oh, it's four minutes. You said five. I said, did I say five? No, I said four. Oh, well, I do apologise, President Officer. Um, I will conclude by... Um, I will, I, will, I will conclude but with apologising again and to state that we hope members will support our amendment and then vote for the amended motion. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Rhoda Grant to wind up the debate for up to five minutes. Ms Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The cost of living crisis is causing fear and alarm to many people. Those that were not managing previously and to those that were just managing. And therefore, any assistance is very welcome. But it's galling, therefore, that this help, designed to help the worst off, um, is going to people who are affluent enough to, to afford a second home, and in some cases multiple second homes, meaning they receive double uh, what those in need are receiving, nearly £10 million going to those who don't need any help at all. Imagine what that money could do in the right hands, helping those who, who so desperately need it. We agree that the UK Government must go further, points made by Alec Rowley and Willie Rennie and indeed many others, but we must also use every intervention available to us here to help people who are struggling with the cost of living crisis. We welcome the change of heart and commitment um, from the Scottish Government to examine options with COSLA and also to go further and look at empty homes as well. But we would ask, that, I, I will turn to Mr Balfour's questions in a moment. We would ask that the government move very quickly because they need to let people know by this autumn what they will be facing for the winter ahead. I know local authorities will be desperate for further income to help the most vulnerable in their communities and they are best placed to do that. Turning to the Conservative Amendment and Jeremy Balfour's questions, there are points in the Conservative Amendment that we would like to examine further and indeed debate further. However, as Willie Rennie pointed out, they delete the crux of our, our motion and that, that, in order, that would claw back some of the funding and divert it to where it's most needed. So we can't possibly support that amendment. Turning um, to Jeremy Balfour's direct questions, councils know the people who are living in second homes, so they can do this quickly and easily. They already have the powers to do it. It would not cost any more than the interventions the Conservatives themselves are proposing. And most importantly, local authorities know where to divert the money so it goes to those most in need. We have to act now because, as Mark Griffin talked about, the stark choice faced between heating or eating, or as he said, starving and freezing that is facing people this coming winter. Food banks themselves are struggling to get supplies as people who would normally donate are struggling to feed themselves. We need to look, at, look again at how we ensure that people have enough food to feed themselves and their families. Heating is also increasing, but that is more so for those 
who are off gas grid. And it's no surprise that those who are off gas grid are most more likely to be in fuel poverty. So we must unite and, and ask this, the UK government to ensure that assistance goes to those who need to fill a gas or oil tank. I don't have time to take an intervention, sorry. Um, because uh, those who are off gas grid face higher costs all round. And indeed, I saw on Facebook today someone saying that a pack of lure pack butter, hardly a luxury, costs £7.25. £7.25 for a pack of butter. Private rentals and people who, who rent privately also face higher costs. They can also live in homes that are not insulated properly and indeed would need the landlord's permission to do anything about that. And we're seeing rental costs increasing rapidly. We need to look at ways of creating a rent freeze. Alec Riley talked about older people and disabled people um, who are at home longer and therefore facing higher fuel costs. And that also goes for people who may require equipment at home, such as dialysis machines. Their bills are increasing. Paul Sweeney called for restraint on profits that energy companies are making from this horrendous situation. And rather than demonising workers who are trying to protect their standard of living to feed their families, we must look at the profits being made from this situation. In conclusion, um, presiding officer, we urge the Scottish Government to act quickly. It's simply wrong that those who are affluent enough to own a second home get a greater share of the help available than those who really need it. This money must be diverted to where it can make the greatest difference, diverted to those who are struggling with the cost of living crisis. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Stunt. That uh, concludes the debate on cost of living support. It's time to move on to the next item of business. There will be a brief pause to allow front benches to change. <laughs>